To the LC building, I'm Jim Cobra, I'm the business department head, and I've had the pleasure of working with Marilyn over a couple of statewide committees, and I get the pleasure of formally introducing you. Thank you, and thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Montana Tech campus. Marilyn actually started at Tech as a petroleum engineering student a couple years ago, right? And then moved on to, to Missoula to, to study. Anyway, formally, the introduction then, Marilyn is the program director for the business administration at Great Falls College, Montana State University. Excuse me. She earned her bachelor's in business administration and bachelor's in education and a master's in business management from the University of Montana. <coughs> she earned her education doctorate from Montana State University in adult and higher education. She taught at a private business school in Great Falls Great Falls for six years and worked at IFG Leasing and went manufacturing or went advertising agency for six years each. And this is your 25th year teaching management and entrepreneurship at Great Falls College. Thanks again for joining us and please join me in welcoming you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a real honor for me to present to you today some information on small business entrepreneurship in Montana. Um, this has been my passion for a lot of years. It is my second favorite topic. Um, my first favorite topic, of course, is not going to move, mm -hmm. is this young man. <laughs> And this is my grandson, and he's a swimmer, so this is at the pool. And I only have a few hundred photos that I'm going to share with you today um, of my grandson and the amazing things he does. I'm teasing, of course, a little. Um, so today's discussion. Broke it out into some of these topics so that we could um, more conveniently and easily kind of move through the discussion. So um, we'll talk a bit about size as it relates to business, big versus small. We're going to back up and even define what an entrepreneur is and some of the characteristics of entrepreneurship and individuals that engage in that. Some demographic groups that tend to be very promising in the current climate. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of entrepreneurship to our national, state, and local economies. We're going to talk about the state of entrepreneurship in our state. Um, going to discuss some of the new directions in entrepreneurship and startup research that is very promising. And um, talk a little bit about how you can support entrepreneurship locally. I'm um, the kind of teacher that really invites people to just say whatever's on their mind whenever they want to say that. So if you feel like <coughs> you have a comment to make or have a question or anything, I'm very open to that. So um, please feel free. Okay. So let me get this next slide going for us. Go Mets. <laughs> <laughs> so how big is small? Okay, uh, when we say small business entrepreneurship, you do understand the word small and you say, well, I get that. But the problem is that the SBA has a very prescriptive definition of what small and large is. And the SBA is that entity, the Small Business Administration Administrative Agency that um, defines um, small as not dominant in its industry and it also has independent owners in there. So the reason why we talk about the size of it, small or big, is because different laws apply to small or to large and availability or access to federal programs and contracts and even funding is dependent on the definition of whether your particular business is small or whether it's large. And generally speaking, but this is very generally speaking, um, large businesses have 500 or more employees, and they generally have a revenue stream, perhaps, of 7.5 million. Um, but the problem is that some industry sectors are pretty much determined small or large based on employees, numbers of employees, but others are based on these revenue streams. So how do you know whether you're small or large? Well, you have to go out to this table of small size standards at the SBA with your North American Industrial Classification Code system, and you find your code inside there, and it will tell you what your classification is according to the SBA. So now we kind of know what the word small means. Now I want to 
do a clicker, but I have to do a pointer. Hang on. There we go. So is Montana big or small? Well, geographically we're big. Of course, we're the fourth largest. But from a business standpoint, we're fairly small. We're very small. We might be micro. Because 99% of Montana businesses are classified as small. And almost 90% of all employment in the state is in a small business. That's significant. The SBA says that there are really, by their classification standards, only 20 businesses in the entire state that would be classified as large. That's also based on that whole business about which industry you're in. Okay? And then approximately 41% of the state's wages and salary jobs are within uh, firms that have fewer than 20 people in them. If we bump ourselves up to 100 people, then we're at 75%. Those are kind of staggering numbers, I think. Um, I always sort of had the feeling that we were a little larger than that. SBA figures. Um, this is a active link, as you can see. And anybody that's interested in the slides, I'll give you my email address, and then I can zip those off to you. And then you can take a look at some of these sites where I found this information. So the next question is, what's an entrepreneur? And uh, as I typed the word entrepreneur a thousand times and was saying it to myself in my head, and it was also transposing the letters of entrepreneur, entrepreneur is not an easy word to type. And it's very easy to get these all jumbled up. E-N-T-R-E, P-R-E, N-E-U-R. I have to give myself a little song when I type it so that I don't get the you know, typos in there and get misspellings. But I thought to myself, I'm going to look at the entomology of the word. It's just a rabbit hole that I went down myself because I just got curious after I was fussing with this peculiar word after a while. So basically, it's 13th century French verb. And that's the first. Um, beginnings of this particular word. In 1730, we have an economist, Cantillon, referred to the word as risk-bearing, or bearing of risk. And he also defined entrepreneurship as a self-employment of any sort at all. Okay. Um, John Baptiste used the term in the early 1800s to refer to individuals who, val who create value in an economy and um, where they move resources from low productivity into more higher productivity yielding areas. In, in 19, eight, sorry, 1848, John Stewart um, used the term in his book, Principles of Political Economy, and that really established the definition that meant that an entrepreneur is a person who assumes both the risk and management of a business. So now entrepreneur, the term itself, is fairly common, settled for us. What are some characteristics? There is unbelievable amounts of literature on the characteristics of entrepreneurs, and they've been studied for a while. But frankly, most of that investigation only goes back to about the 70s. And in the 70s, it was discovered through a research project that small businesses create jobs and are healthy for our economy. And that really was the spurring event for entrepreneurship to take hold. And entrepreneurship started to be studied more and more. And the idea of this small business entity contributing to the economic well-being or being the cornerstone of the economy or the health and well-being of the economy really started to take place. So in those early studies, people that had confidence, were willing to fail, leadership skills, risk takers, those kind of individuals are the ones that were most characteristic in successful entrepreneurs that have been studied. Another characteristic that I think is a really important one is that they have a very high tolerance for ambiguity. They don't worry about what the problem is in front of them. They see the problem, they analyze the problem, and they climb over the top of it, generally without too much concern. Um, that High tolerance for ambiguity allows them to sort of stay optimistic about where they're going, keep a laser focus on their target, and just move around what gets in their way. They're problem solvers. And as I think about my time here at Montana Tech, that was a long time ago, 
Engineers were problem solvers. Engineers are problem solvers. My son graduated from here and he learned the skill sets of problem solving. And I think those are very closely aligned with entrepreneurs. They understand the reasons for solving problems and their high tolerance for ambiguity doesn't discourage them when they don't come up with the answer right away. So let's talk a little bit about some of the demographics of entrepreneurs. The boomers are getting a lot of attention lately. And even though it sort of seems contrary that baby boomers who are entering their retirement years now would be a segment that would be very interested in entrepreneurship. The ages of 55 to 64 have a higher entrepreneurial activity rate than those aged 20 to 34. This date right here tells you that the information that I got and the most current information I could find about that was 2012 information. We're going to talk a little bit about the problem of getting the most current information about this data. Very difficult sometimes. So some of those individuals just want to continue to work. And some of them, out of necessity, the Great Recession wiped out a lot of their money. And so they're looking at entrepreneurship as an avenue to create some wealth back again for themselves. The relative percentage of entrepreneurs increased by almost 7% for people 55 to 64 between the years of 96 and 2011. 96 to 2011, 96 to 2012 is sort of a significant period because the most significant research on entrepreneurship stepped back and gathered that information and now going forward has taken sort of a different perspective, a more current perspective on gathering that information. So going back to 96, we're pretty confident in those numbers. Um, by contrast, the percentage dropped 5% for people 20 to 44 during that same period. So our younger people are not necessarily stepping into that. A little bit troubling. A um, couple of other things I um, might say to you is that there are some characteristics that maybe maturity brings to you. Um, a true entrepreneur tends to, um, they, they tend to have kind of a combination of two important characteristics. And one of those important characteristics is that they are enthusiastic about ideas and they habitually come up with new ideas. They're thinking about how could we do this different? And that, that's one very strong characteristic. And maybe that's in a problem solver, just a regular problem solver, those, that habitual, let's see what else is new, what can we discover here. But the other thing that makes the entrepreneur be effective is that he has um, a tenacity to see the project through. So once the idea comes forward, they sort of latch on to that, and then they take great effort to move it, advance it, get it to the market, see where they can take it. A little bit more about boomers. Some people retire and find that they are bored to death and they want to stay active and mentally engaged. And this is Mary Beth Izard, who coined a new term, boomerpreneurs, which is kind of hard to get off the tongue. Boomerpreneurs. <laughs> um, they want to make money. Um, maybe they just want to be engaged because perhaps they were entrepreneurs before their retirement and they miss it. And the Kauffman Foundation is one of the organizations that is the most respected in entrepreneurship research. And they have something that's called a fast track program designed specifically for people over 50 years old. So um, Butte has an SBDC, Small Business Development Center. And that SBDC does some training for entrepreneurs that are not going to college, but maybe writing a small business plan or you know, seeking financing. And so the fast track package that's owned by um, the Kauffman Foundation is used in many, many SBDCs um, to train individuals over a quick eight week to 10 week course where they learn entrepreneurship and write a business plan in that same time frame. Some of you um, probably have 
had entrepreneurs approach you, maybe from the community. I get them about once a year, a person calls my phone and says, uh, I need some help writing a business plan. And it's usually about Friday at about 2.30, 3 o'clock. <laughs> and they tell me they need it by Monday morning. You know, we need to get this turned around pretty fast. And that generally is sort of uh, uh, indicative of the characteristic of an entrepreneur. You know, they see what they need and they start going for it right that very second, not knowing necessarily that sometimes this is a developing process. A um, couple more things I want to say to you about this is that the um, Kauffman Foundation really was um, on the forefront of some of this um, explosion of academic um, interest in entrepreneurship. When I first started at the college in 1991, we had an entrepreneurship degree, and I struggled like heck to find good support materials from um, publishing companies, find a book, um, wasn't really interested at 18 credits to write my own book and start to deliver out of that. So it was really just a struggle. And there was about, after I did a little bit of research, about 1,200 campuses across the United States that had anything that had to do with the word entrepreneurship. It's really become its own discipline over the years, but it's not new, 1919, Babson College was the very first university in the United States to set up a school of business that focused most specifically on entrepreneurship. So Kauffman Foundation is, plays a big role in this information. Well, now that I'm a grandmother, I get the AARP magazine, <laughs> and this particular <laughs> um, graphic and information that went along with the article is talking about these boomer entrepreneurs, older entrepreneurs, 50 to 64, and the hottest states for old entrepreneurs is Montana, Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, and Alaska. The coldest states in 2012 were not by temperature, but by not having any old people start up businesses, was Illinois, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Delaware, and Virginia. I kind of think of them. I think of that part of the country as sort of a hotbed of entrepreneurship and business activity, and the East Coast. Um, I, you know what? Alaska, maybe by necessity, right? I mean, <laughs> I haven't visited Alaska, so I'm sure that it is a magnificent, magnificently um, enhanced business climate there. But I do kind of think of that as the wilderness a bit. I just think it probably has a little bit of something to do with that. People want to stay in Alaska, well, Montana too, and say, well, I'd like to stick around. There's not a whole lot of, like you said, not many large companies. Yeah. Uh, I guess I better try to figure something out. Where am I going to go? Right. Okay. So then the next group that we might talk about after boomers is the millennials. And the millennials are born from 81 to 97. They represent about 85 million Americans today, and they also represent up to 75% of the American workforce. Now, of course, millennials on the edge of 97 are, you know, they're still in school, okay, some of them. And nine, on, on the edge of 81 are turning exactly into the age at 34 that is prime for entrepreneurship. So as the millennials age, we're going to count on them to be entrepreneurs. Is that a little scary? <laughs> I'm not a millennial, so that doesn't scare me. But um, I, I think it's important that that particular segment be studied. And I also think it's important that we understand that there are some problems with this particular demographic. And a couple of those problems really are that it, it though, that particular group tends to be very entrepreneurial in its nature, the characteristics. They're optimistic, they're socially conscious. 
They recognize opportunity and they are generally first adopters of new products and technology. Um, they're the most educated demographic. They're the most exposed to entrepreneurship courses and education because there are 20 times more courses offered today than there were in 1985. 20 times more entrepreneurship education offerings than in 1985. Um, the median net worth, however, for households under 35 is down 43% between 1995 and 2013. in constant dollars. According to a recent Fast Company article, new entrepreneurs between 20 and 34 fell 24.7% last year, compared to 34.3% of the people who were at the same age in 1996 when they started their business. So that percentage between millennials and people in, at nine, in 1996 has dropped that much. Data shows that 30% of the generation between 82 and 2003 still live with their parents. Okay, 2003, that wasn't that old, but you expect some of those, but certainly 1982. My son is younger than that. I'm not interested in him moving back home still living with their parents. Also, if they don't live with their parents, there's a higher um, likelihood that they live with a roommate because their income does not support them finding housing that they can afford. Um, the, sad, the sad sort of truth is that boomer parents are more likely to be entrepreneurs than their millennial children. A lot of that has to do with the rising cost of education. Because when my parents Absolutely. went to school, they paid I would totally agree with that. Yep. And you've just taken a little bit out of my present presentation. But that crippling debt that's out there is stopping people from being able to invest in ideas. And those are problems that I think we have to address, and I think we have to address them quickly. Because if we don't have a sustained small business growth, our economy is going to suffer dramatically for that. Let's talk about another group. Before we leave this one, yes. Gentlemen, yes. is there any indication of the, a loss of the characteristic of risk taking? What we, you know, what we've observed as business faculty, particularly when we serve some of our, our student population, our business students, is that even when they're playing something like a simulation game, which we do in our strategic management class, there's no risk taking in a situation where they really can't lose anything, not really. Um, and, 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 and it seems to have been drained out of them somewhere along the line that they just simply won't take any risk. Mm -hmm. And it sort of plugs right into, you know, if an entrepreneur is going to take risks right. is, a, is a person who has that characteristic. Right. And we somehow drained it out of our kids. So what, what did we do wrong? And, and I would chime in that maybe that um, tolerance for ambiguity yeah. is, is kind of weak in our, in our younger generations. Um, I, some, we have some faculty in here. I have students who s want every specific of every part of every assignment that I give them. They want to know precisely how many pages and how many words and what, is it ha and what topic should I write it on. And, and so if I give them sort of vague instructions, hoping that I could get you know, some creativity and innovation in some of the focus that they take, I get a lot of pushback from my students. So maybe the characteristics of entrepreneurs have sort of lost a bit. Um, I personally don't know about that research. I think that would be fascinating to dig into and see if we could identify that risk-taking um, adversity. A lot of that probably has to do with school reform in the last couple of decades. Because when I started school, there was a lot of creativity that was wandering around doing whatever you felt like. As I got through high school, it was far more, you will do this test, you will fill in this bubble. 
so a more prescriptive educational climate than, um, than allowing people to be more interpretive and open. Yeah. Um, and of course, I, I think that in either direction, you probably underserve the student, right? If you leave them to their own devi devices entirely, um, they may not get to where you want them to go without some kind of structure. I, I, I remember fondly my um, oldest son who had a paper in um, elementary school and we went to the teacher-parent conference and I could hardly read the paper. I mean, it was, it, it was, there were letters on the paper, but it was very difficult to read. And I said to the teacher, I said, this is not good. I, we need to get him up to speed on his language skills. Oh no, we didn't, we didn't do anything with language skills. This was simply a creative paper that nobody could read. You know, how, how, if, you, if you don't have some of the mechanics there, how do you even know what the idea was on the paper? And so left to their own devices may not be that good either. Um, we'll talk some more about this as we advance here a little bit. Um, immigrants is our next one. Business ownership rate is higher for immigrants than non-immigrants. 10.5% of the immigrant workforce owns a business compared to 9.3% of non-immigrant US-born workforce. Business information rates among immigrants are higher, sorry, not information, formation. Rates among immigrants are higher than among non-immigrants. The business formation rate per month among immigrants is 0.62 or 620 out of every 100,000. And this rate of business formation is much higher then we compare that to the non-immigrant rate of 0.28%. Again, 2012 information. So that would say approximately one out of 10 people have their own business? Yeah. Um, quite a number of case studies out there about immigrants in New York City. A cab company, as some of you are, I'm sure, familiar with the cab company, who really started out um, helping immigrant cab drivers and help them buy their own cabs so that they own that particular automobile as opposed to just use the automobile that was there for the, from the company. But then the company helped them with distribution and picking up customers, et cetera. And they would allow them to borrow money from the company to buy that cab. And what they discovered was that there was almost a zero default rate on the loans by these immigrants that came and borrowed money from that company <laughs> to buy their cab so they could work for that company. It, so much so that they actually went into financing because that particular population was so low risk for them, it was better than being in the cab business. <laughs> it was better to finance people to buy cabs. So I think that... Um, Especially I, now after Uber. Yes. <laughs> and this case study that I had was like, you know, years before Uber, but might have been some fodder for that. A um, couple of more things here. Um, immigrants are almost twice as likely to start businesses, especially in 2012, as native-born Americans. 28.5% of entrepreneurs in 2014 were immigrants which is up from 13% in 1997, more than double. About one quarter of the engineering and technology companies started in the United States between 2006 and 2012 had at least one key founder who was an immigrant. Um, one of the things that has been toyed with and that I found in some of the research was some ideas about changing the way that we offer visas to immigrants. So create a new category of visa that might be called a startup visa. And there is a visa for immigrants to come with their own money and invest in the United States. And that one has had some success. But this particular startup visa would be a visa that would allow people who had come here to the United States to work or to go to school to have a visa that helps them start up the business idea that they have. And that startup visa is being somewhat used in a, in a similar sort of fashion in Canada and New Zealand right now. Um, 
the premise behind that, though, is to make sure that those visas and those startups boost the economy by hiring people. So one of the criteria for you to continue to have that startup visa would be that you have some employment requirements that you would meet. Not so stringent that you wouldn't, that makes the um, visa unattractive, but stringent enough that makes that visa worthwhile to the economy. Um, and again, Canada and New Zealand tend to be the ones that are sort of in the forefront of this idea of a startup visa. So now, after we've talked about entrepreneurs and their characteristics and some demographic groups that might fall into those, we need to talk a little bit about how important entrepreneurship is and, and startups. These are kind of startling pieces of information too. This comes from 2014. Again, the Kauffman Foundation primarily. And the startups are responsible for all net job creation. All net job creation over the last three decades. And lots and lots of data support that entrepreneurship results in more vibrant, opportunistic, and prosperous communities. We know that. It's an economic engine. Without startups, there would be no net job growth in the US economy. That's true on the average because a lot of data is collected that way. However, this is even more relevant because it's true for all but the last seven years going all the way back to 1977. During recessionary times, job creation at startups remains relatively stable. That's 2010 information. But net job losses at existing firms are highly sensitive to business cycles changes in the downturn in the economy. Here's a graph that states um, startups create most new net jobs in the United States. So the blue, the lighter blue, is net jobs from startups. <coughs> and the black is net job change of existing firms. That's a pretty strong picture of the support of the importance of um, startups, entrepreneurship. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes. How long is a company a startup? Oh, and that's when a... When do they become an existing firm? Because if it's a startup this year and it goes out of business next year, right. that, that, then is it an existing firm? When it goes out of business the year following the year, it's... That, it's if it goes out of business, it's not classified as existing at all. But your question... No, but, but, but it, but your question about how long are you a new startup and how much time do we get to give you before we start you know, before looking you start at that, right. The black right. Numbers. Well, that depends on whose research you look at. But generally, it's considered to be about three years, about three years. Most of the time, I see that figure. Um, one the piece of the research I found was one year, and I thought that was a little out of sync with the other research. But a little short. Is that something to do with how the federal government says that most businesses are at a loss for the first three years? Well, this isn't, you know, this, it's important to recognize that this data is not talking about whether these businesses are su successful or not. It's talking about whether they actually created jobs. Right. So almost the creation of jobs and the deterioration and destruction of jobs that churning, that engine of success and failure and success and failure, that's the part that creates the jobs. And I found that to be pretty fascinating. That's my interpretation of the research that I read. It is the, that, that startup and that failure, are, the failure is equally important to the startup almost because people learn from that failure and if you're an entrepreneur true at heart, you're not going to stop at that and you'll start it again. And the next time you might be more successful. We have a category of entrepreneurs, not just um, boomerpreneurs, but we have serial entrepreneurs who start businesses over and over again. And, and they abandon businesses that become successful because they, they get bored with them. So they go to another business that's in <laughs> pretty bad shape. And the excitement is getting that up and running again.
little bit more on the importance of entrepreneurs and startups. The per capita rate of business formation in the United States has been slow and, and on a steady downward trend since the 1990s. So we have lost the amount of entrepreneurship and startups over the course of these decades from the 90s. It wasn't until between 2010 and 2011 new business formation rebounded. And that was after our Great Recession. So we would expect that recovery would show some increase in entrepreneurship. What's the most significant, I think, in this particular information is that the rise between 2010 and 2011 was geographically dispersed throughout the United States. So what that says to me is that this is just not a pocket of entrepreneurship that sort of bubbled to the surface. This is a geographically dispersed phenomenon that's showing that entrepreneurship is on the rise. Here is some of the information. Again, Kauffman um, Foundation took a look at 2009 to 2010 for the states. This is our individual states and that's collective aggregate information. And so the increase between 2010 and 2011 significant in the states, 88.2%. And the Kauffman <coughs> Foundation, just as of the last couple of years, has started to study select metro areas, cities, and this is the data for those select cities. So that's promising information, 2010, 2011. Um, catch up to my notes here. One thing I will tell you, let me back up one slide. Sorry about that. The increase in entrepreneurial activity as a result of these new um, research methods that Kaufman is focusing on, and they bring more current information to the market faster. The increase in entrepreneurial activity <coughs> in the 2015 <coughs> index, which is just a few months old, actually came out in June of 2015, represents the largest year-over-year -year increase in the last two decades. So the increase in entrepreneurship and business creation in the states had its largest increase year to year in 2015. And that gives us all kinds of hope for a revival of entrepreneurship in the future. So now, I backed up just a little bit from our nationals and our state status, and I took a look at some information that came out of Harvard. And, um, this information was created by Michael Porter and two of his colleagues at Harvard. And uh, Michael Parter, Porter is the father of strategic management. Um, this group took sort of a convenient sample here of Harvard Business School alumni. And that was from 2011, 12, 13, 14, and 15 from companies that were small and large domestic and international, and they gave them this particular survey. There's quite a lot of information that was in this survey. Um, but respondents were asked at one point to compare the U.S., the overall U.S. business environment to that of other advanced economies. And this is the information that came out of that. Um, oh, and I, I'm glad that you can see that better than I thought you would. <laughs> um, so what's so significant to me is that in the quadrant that gives us, uh, compared to other advanced economies, the U.S. position, and a trajectory compared to other advanced economies, so the U.S. trajectory to other economies compared to the position, is entrepreneurship in the farthest right-hand upper quadrant. And other factors that are there are the strength of our universities, capital markets, management innovation, property rights, hiring and firing processes, communications infrastructures. What's disturbing a bit is that logistics infrastructures have fallen into the strength but deteriorating, and those are bridges, 
roads, railroads. Um, our macro policy, skilled labor regulation, but thankfully, um, weakness but improving is vacant, and weakness but deteriorating is sadly full of K through 12 educational system, our political system, um, health care, and the tax code. Now, this is information from the 2015 report, but you'll be glad to know that all of these factors, but one, moved to the upper right, to the upper right hand corner from 2011, except the tax code. The tax code pretty much stayed stagnant from this survey taken in 2011. Everything else more optimistically moving toward the upper right hand corner. Entrepreneurship leading the pack. So now let's talk a little bit about entrepreneurship in Montana. Well, it's a hotbed, according to the New York Times. And that article came out on June 17th of 2015. And the New York Times, of course, was quoting the Kauffman Foundation research and extrapolating information from that report. Montana has ranked number one in the Coffin Index of Entrepreneurial Activity since 2012. There are other indexes of state entrepreneurial activity. Nebraska has one. They don't use the same methodology, but Nebraska also shows that Montana is climbing up in the ranks. Montana moved from 17th place to number one in 2012 under the methodology that Kaufman was using back then. Kaufman has changed its methodology in assessing that ranking. 2014 was that adjustment. In Montana that rate is 540 new startups per month per 100,000 residents. And that is twice the national average. We now, have, we have about a million residents, so that says that there's 5,400 per month. And frankly, I look around and I don't see. <laughs> that's, what, that's what that data is reflecting. But one of the things it's not saying, and that's because the research doesn't go in that direction, is where are these located in the state of Montana? And I would propose to you that we're close to the Bakken and we're close enough to the Bakken to have at least contributed something to that number as a result of the oil fields and the oil boom. So would any of those be agricultural is one question? Not or agricultural. They're all non-agricultural Right, general, startup. yes. And does it mean 100,000 residents or 100,000 residents who are over some age? No, because just the one year right, old right, right, exactly. It's just by population. Just by population. Right, just by population. Not by adult population. No. Not by people who could be starting, no. It's just by population rates. But if, but if Doug started a business in his basement, that would count. Home, home base, basement. yep, home based businesses. If you registered it, I mean, is this somebody has to, you have yes. to go somewhere to get a business license. Right. <laughs> right. And when they talk about job startups, they're looking at payroll <laughs> records, they're looking at the um, IRS to get information you, you about payroll or the business license established that it had started, mm -hmm. but they have to go to the IRS to get information about payroll to find out if they've in fact hired people and are paying taxes on those individuals. But that, those 540 aren't necessarily doing that, they just have a business license. Those That's just startups, right, right, right. right. So we've moved away from the conversation about how many they started up, but just how many are there. And I think that we can take the short trip that at, if, this, if these are successful, then the logical next step is that they would start to hire individuals. So yes, good question, excellent question. So under this new type of index, there are three metrics that are used. And the first one for, um, and this is Montana's numbers, 
is to determine the rate of new entrepreneurs. Okay? And this particular one just talks about that 540 per 100,000 people. So a 50.54% represents 540 people. That says adult population. Right. So Montana wouldn't have... It does say adult population there. It wouldn't have 10 times 540, it would maybe have 5 times. The other slide said residents. Right, it did say residents, but that's the same number, but it's only for adult population. Therein lies some of the problem with some of the data. <laughs> Being able to find the data consistently um, using the same um, methodology and the same information, it's, it was a challenge. Let me take you to one more of these um, metrics. Opportunity share of new entrepreneurs. So this particular slide is telling you at an 84% ranking or rating, it's 8.4 out of every 10 new entrepreneurs in Montana did that not coming from having lost a job. Let me go back and say that a little bit better. 8.4 out of every 10 new entrepreneurs in Montana did not come directly from unemployment. In other words, this is opportunity that was recognized. This was an investment in opportunity not necessarily what we're talking about, baby boomers who, out of necessity, may have to start their own business in order to survive. And then startup density. Startup density is the number of startups per 100,000 residents in the population. And the startup businesses here are defined as firms that are less than one year old. A lot of false starts at getting businesses off the ground, perhaps. So um, I, can, I think it's kind of important that we talk about some of the research and some of the problems with it. Um, the Kauffman Foundation is one of the very first ones to talk about the limitations on the accessibility of some of the research. And that's not because you can't access data. They can access the data from the Census Bureau and from the IRS and from lots of other different sources. But what they're having trouble with is not having a, a government supported agency that supports their private foundation to explore these kinds of research questions. So the research always seems to be behind when you'd want it. It's not available for policymakers or universities or campuses or decision makers or small business people. It just isn't coming in a timely enough fashion. And that really is part of the reason why they have partnered with the Census Bureau and actually the Department of Commerce and the Census Bureau to take data from their warehouses and use that data in order to come up with better forecasts about entrepreneurship and the state of entrepreneurship. Um, the Kauffman Foundation has done what I consider to be a remarkable um, volume of work in just the past few years. So when I, the last time I had been out there was the struggle to find some things, but they have really stepped up their game and really created, since 2013, huge amounts of information. I, um, sounds like I'm a champion for um, the Kauffman Foundation, but I certainly was able to, in my sort of lit review, come back to Kauffman. Um, for example, I thought I was gonna get some great new information from the New York Times, and there they were citing Kauffman, and, and then I'd find something else, and there they were citing Kauffman. And so I, you know, when I worked on my dissertation, my chair said, when you keep coming back to the same source, you probably have got a pretty good handle on the lit review because they seem to all be going back to that same singular place. Can you tell us a little bit about the Kaufman Foundation? Yes. Um, Ewing Marion Kaufman was a business person in Kansas City, um, created a fortune for himself in entrepreneurship, did very well. And virtually millions of dollars of his wealth has gone to create this foundation for just the simple reason that entrepreneurship is important to the economy, 
It's a gateway to the middle class for people. And he just feels like he benefited so much from his ability to start a business, keep his own profits, turn it around, hire people, all of those parts that are part of entrepreneurship, he felt like it was a critical component. And his particular foundation is kind of driven um, on this one focus of studying entrepreneurship. Does it have a particular political orientation like the Koch brothers seem to have? I know, I know. Um, not that I'm aware of. I had the very good fortune about eight years ago to be invited to the Kauffman Foundation headquarters in Kansas City. Um, I had sort of serendipitously um, asked that I might participate in using some of their entrepreneurship materials in one of my classes. And they graciously said, you betcha. And they sent me as much as I wanted and copies for all of my students. And they just completely loaded up my class. And then um, invited faculty who they did that for across the nation to come to about a four day event in Kansas City and just simply grind page by page through that support material, through that textbook, through the business plan model, through all of the parts of that particular um, curriculum to improve it and change it and modify it and get suggestions. And, and that was a really fabulous experience for, um, for me. But it sounds like you're an advocate yes. for entrepreneurship, yes. not an independent observer of entrepreneurship. Right, right. Right. They, they're very deeply involved in it. And I was impressed when I went there and saw how, how involved they were. But now, you know, the research that's out there since 2013, I, I think they really kicked it up. They're also global. Yes. Um, and that um, back now, gosh, 20 years now, a friend of mine was uh, worked for the Kaufman, and we were based in Hong Kong at the time. And his full-time job was finding the right people to give money to. I volunteered, but it didn't work. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, so it's, um, um, that's a lot of money. A <laughs> lot, a lot of money. Um, um, <coughs> USASB, the United States Small Business, um, what is that particular conference, help me, faculty, the USASB conference, um, is heavily funded by the Kauffman Foundation and the Coleman Foundation, also deep into startups and entrepreneurship. and. Uh, went to that conference one year, and faculty were given an opportunity to do um, elevator presentations. You get two minutes to make your pitch. Um, and they wrote us checks for $5,000 to go home and seed up that particular project that we were um, working on. But you only had two minutes to pitch it. That was just, you know, an elevator, you know, that's from the time you get to the end till you get to the top floor, that's how much time you get to um, make your presentation. And that was uh, just so fascinating, so, uh, terrifying. What I'm hearing is if you have an entrepreneurial idea that you think is a good one, these two foundations would be places that you might go to and actually see whether they'd be willing to fund your idea? I don't know how much they go to the granular level of the entrepreneur. I think what I've, what I've seen so far is that they're interested in the training, the curriculum, the environment, making an important part of the culture. Um, and that seems to be where their focus is. They, um, they treat people who participate in whatever they're doing very well. They're, they're top drawer organization. The first time I was ever picked up at an airport in a limousine <laughs> by a guy who had my name on a card <laughs> was the Kaufman Foundation. They had my last name on the card and I was, are you talking to me? Is this real? It was very, very, very impressive. They treated us extraordinarily well. And they expected us to work, and we did, but it was fun. So the research is coming. It's getting better all the time. It's improving. And I think we need to figure out how to support entrepreneurship locally. So I think we think globally, but live, I like the live word, better than act locally. Think globally, live locally, meaning keep a global perspective on everything, but of course, buy your goods and services locally. Support small businesses that are here, buy from them. And the internet has created some interesting dynamic there. We can shop anywhere we want now. 
Um, and it will get to our door in a matter of minutes, really, in comparison to years ago. Um, ordered something from Amazon, needed it. I had it the next afternoon. Virtually no delay in my mind. But should I have purchased that locally? So I always ask myself that question. Should I have purchased that locally? Because I've supported a small entrepreneur who's supporting some employees who are getting paychecks, who are paying taxes, who are supporting the local school system, who are paying the cops and the firemen, and they're filling the potholes that I drive into on the roads. So that mechanism is tantamount to me. It's important. So I go out of my way to buy locally wherever I can, wherever I can. And I know that there's lots of folks here who have lots of great experience and knowledge, and I encourage everybody to help startups wherever you can. And the Service Corps of Retired Executives um, takes people that aren't even retired and allows them to work um, as an assistant, usually through the SBDC or through a Chamber of Commerce, to help small businesses get up and get going. Sometimes people just need a little encouragement. Sometimes people just need a little push. Um, so if you have any interest in any of these slides or any of those sites that I gave you, if you just email me and just put presentations in the actual subject line, then I will flash you back here, <laughs> the PowerPoints that I have here, and then you can link to them because those are topics. So and we're thank also you very much. videotaping this, and it should be available on our digital comments um, within a week or so. <coughs> Do you take questions? Oh, absolutely, and, or discussions, or, or any suggestions for things that we might look at, risk aversion, and those kind of things. I think those are important topics. I teach at a two-year campus, so research is not one of the prongs that I work with. So research is something that um, is a little sporadic for me, but I certainly love going down some of these rabbit holes and discovering some of this and challenging my you know, own understanding of reading some of the research itself. Yeah. So from the formation of a business idea to opening doors, generally you can just bring how time long it take to open doors. If I had to give you a ballpark amount of time, I'd say about 18 months. But you know that is so dependent on how much the entrepreneur knows to start up you know, right from the very beginning. If they don't really know anything about a business plan, you know, the person who calls me and says, at 3 o'clock on Friday, I need a plan by Monday, that person's probably going to take 18 months. <laughs> we, d we did the um, fast track. We did it in 8 weeks to 10 weeks. But a lot of the individuals that went to that fast track were exactly that, prepared to be on a fast track. So they had some business knowledge already, or they had started a business and it you know, faltered, and now they were looking for that. Um, I, I get a lot of students who have started businesses in their past in the program that we have in Great Falls. I can't even tell you how many people have said to me, if I had known just this one piece of information when I started my business, I think everything would have been different. Mm -hmm. You know, they look at that one pivotal piece of information that kind of, you know, sunk their ship. Yeah, 18 months. And what's the brief, just a brief set of steps in that process? I mean, what are the steps? That kind of scares me, that question. Um, so let me, let me explain it this way. In this entrepreneurship program, which is two years on our campus, we start them out with some very fundamental business constructs, intro to business, and then we, we spin them off into management and accounting and marketing and human resource management and advertising, and they take those classes. And then the entrepreneurship class is their capstone class, and so then we pull them all back into this common understanding of business, and they write a business plan in that class. So this, the entire class is taught from the standpoint of, you have to produce this business plan, and now what's going to go into it? And what would you know about this section or that section of it? And how would we pull that together? And um, so I would say to you, what you need to do is say, what are the important factors in my business? What do I need to know about in my business? And then 
I think we need to work smarter instead of harder. So go and read some business plans. Go find some business plans and see what they put in their table of contents because there's going to be some typical elements in there. And um, the SBA has a fabulous bunch of information that helps you do that. And then use examples that other people have put in there because they give you ideas that you didn't even think about. Oh, I should address that. Those kind of things. And so then you just sort of backfill. It's, a, it's an interesting process. And when I first started to teach entrepreneurship, I thought, OK, well, you know, we'll have a business plan at the end of this semester. And I didn't pace things very well. And I didn't say, by this date, you must have this done, at least a draft of it, that kind of thing. So I learned quickly that it's, um, it, it, it's an integrated process that has to have some harmony, but you cannot do it all at once. Little pieces moving forward. One last sure. Um, since failure is a pretty consistent factor in the startup uh, industry, uh, what what generally happens in the event of a failure for a small business? I mean, especially concerning uh, if you owe more than you have available assets. I would say that's completely dependent on where you got the money to start that thing in the first place. Um, if you borrowed from family and friends, <laughs> that could be bad. <laughs> that could be bad. Um, bankruptcy, of course, is an ultimate sort of spot that you might find yourself in. Um, businesses, though, will find themselves, it's cyclical. So they will find themselves in bad shape at some times and then in very good shape at other times. So, so what I think really creates the health of a, of a small business is that they have a great relationship with a banker. And you never want to surprise your banker. You want to tell them all the time that you know where you are. Confide in them that, OK, we're in this hard time, but I know we're going to come out. We've done it before. And you have a plan for how you're going to come out of that. Um, if, if you have investors, like Howard Schultz did before he started Starbucks, if you read the story of Howard Schultz and Starbucks, it's an astounding story, I think. And he was $5 million in the hole before he turned the corner on Starbucks. Coffee, we're talking coffee. But he had this sort of vision about how coffee might be brought into this culture in a way that had never been brought into the culture before. He saw people drinking coffee in small European Parisian cafes, and he said, we need to do that here. And he, that was sort of his vision, and he brought it. I, thought, I think to myself, if I was $5 million in the hole on a coffee shop, would I keep going? <laughs> would my investors keep going? They did. They did. And he turned the corner. He turned the corner. So it depends on where you got your money, what might happen to you. Yeah, I think. I'm, Almost entirely. So we have some other esteemed faculty here that would be <laughs> willing to weigh in on what happens to you when you crash and burn. You have to go back to school. <laughs> Sometimes, and, and you know, the, the, yeah. those folks that have that sort of serial right. entrepreneur, right. they go, oh, that was a failure. What happened here? OK, well, this is what went wrong. Now let's see if we can run that up the flagpole again. Only we'll do something different. Our flow chart will look different. This new entrepreneur of the study price right now, is there any feeling on what industries this is in? What, what services? Uh, in janitorial, is it tech? In Montana, when we're when you have a Okay. I, I think it's in a lot of services, and I do think that it is focused a lot in the eastern part of Montana. But I don't have any data on that. And even our um, um, Business Bureau, our, our uh, Bureau of Business and Economic Research, they kind of don't focus in on entrepreneurship. They focus in on economic impact, and they focus in on some industries like forestry um, and, some, and some of those kinds of things. They don't really zero in on who's starting up a business and what kind of businesses are they in, what is the nature of those businesses. So that, that, isn't, that isn't information that people have gleaned out very well. Or at least I have not found that. <laughs> you can do a poll. You could ask how many people here have started a small business any time in their life. And yes. You could say how many have started within the last three years or something. And yes. you, I think you'll get some hands raised. Yes. How many people started a business in their life here? I kind of by, you know, by 
I'm married to someone who started that business. That's okay. You can no, I, thought you say, I thought you say you're married, you started the business. No, no. <laughs> um, my husband started the business. I thought, oh, so he wasn't the new business. He wasn't. He <laughs> and, and so how many have started a new business like within the last three years? But I know, you know, a number of faculty sort of start a consulting business. Yes, yes. Okay, whether they're employing anybody because they can consult. Yes. Um, yes. I, I, I desperately want to start a food truck. <laughs> well, I mean, but if you get a business license, you're counted. Mm -hmm. So some of those definitions said you had to have one employee. So uh, does some of this data exclude the single person business? Well, a sole proprietor can't count themselves as an employee. Right, but the 540 didn't require you have an employee. It was something you did after that that was something about having Right, and, and the, the problem that I found with the research again was that I'd find something here and then I'd find something over here that maybe was similar but contradicted a little bit, but what I discovered was there was just so many differences between the two of them, I didn't feel like I was talking about apples and oranges that could draw much of a conclusion between them. So that, therein lies some of this, the Kaufman's interest in getting this information in order so we can actually interpret it well. Okay, so... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.